Welcome to the Science Salon Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. We post these conversations on average once a week as part of the larger mission of the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine. We're a 501c3 nonprofit education organization devoted to promoting science and reason. And as such, we depend upon and appreciate your support. So if you find this podcast valuable, along with our magazine and other projects we work on, please support us at skeptic.com slash donate. You can do there um, PayPal, Patreon. You can donate through our own shop, Skeptic. You can go old school and just mail us a check. We have a P.O. box. Uh, or you can just call us on the phone. I'll even give you the number, 626-794-3119. And uh, so that's um, that's the general introduction to the podcast. Uh, I want to note here that we have had technical difficulties, as you can see. Uh, I'm in a nice studio here in Santa Barbara. The local um, NPR uh, affiliated station here was kind enough to let me shift from my home based studio, which was not that great, to a much better studio here. So you can expect much better uh, sound quality and video quality, hopefully, as well. Uh, my guest for this episode is the great Franz Duvall. And I've known Franz since the 90s, um, and uh, I've hosted him a couple times at Caltech for his various books like Private Politics. He is the Dutch-American ethologist and zoologist, having earned a Ph.D. in biology from the University of Utrecht in 1977. He completed a six-year study of the chimpanzee colony at Burger's Zoo in Arnhem before moving to the United States. His first popular book, Chimpanzee Politics, compared the schmoozing and scheming of chimpanzees involved in power struggles with that of human politicians. Ever since, Duvall has drawn parallels between primate and human behavior. By the way, he... Um, that's in that book is where he quoted um, or coined the term alpha male, which actually came from study of wolves. He applied it to primates, and so as he notes in in this new book, um, the uh, description of Trump as an alpha male, uh, he was not happy about because alpha males act differently actually than Trump. Uh, anyway, it was great to talk to Franz. His book is uh, Mama's Last Hug: uh, Animal and Human Emotions. Uh, Mama is a a chimp, and, and uh, as you can read about in here, her last hug is hugging actually her trainer or caretaker at the zoo where she was at uh, and basically comforting him as he was feeling sad uh, as she was dying. It's a very moving story. The whole book is, is quite not just moving, but it's also packed with uh, research as Franz's books normally are. So we, we talked about that, uh, the nature of of uh, emotions, where they come from, their evolutionary history, the difference between uh, feelings and emotions. Feelings are these internal states, emotions are the expressions of them, and why it's important to make that distinction. Um, the the hundred year delay between Darwin's book on this subject, the expression of the emotions in man and animals, uh, before it became acceptable to study scientifically, and that really wasn't until the 80s and 90s. And so that's really more than a century, um, and now it's it's kind of becoming much more acceptable to talk about animal emotions uh, in a scientific way, uh, whereas it wasn't before. And uh, that, that's quite interesting. We also talked about uh, Trump as the uh, alpha male or not, um, and how so much of human politics through the lens of of a biologist like Franz, looks like a bunch of apes running around <laughs> acting ape-like, and that's that's correct. We also talked about um, the problem of other minds. How do you know what another animal is feeling? I mean, to what extent are we just projecting, anthropomorphically speaking, our own feelings onto those of animals? Well, we do. Uh, and so Franz talks about when that's okay, when it's not okay to do that, and 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 so on. And and then we end the discussion talking about animal rights um, and the fact that animals are sentient, uh, that is, and the difference between that and consciousness and intelligence. These are different states in the animal brains, and that and the one we should be concerned about is sentience. That is, can they feel, and especially can they suffer? Um, so it's a, it's a great conversation. He's one of the most interesting people I've met in a long time. Uh, before we started recording, I was reminding him of the story of when we were both in line at a passport check um, clearance in Toronto, 
Canada. It was a Sunday morning. We were, uh, uh, I was at a conference. He was at some other conference. We, I didn't even know he was there. And I'm reading this newspaper standing in line. Um, I think it was the New York Times, actually. And, 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 the, and there was a big review of his latest book, whichever one that was. And I'm reading this and reading this, and I finish it, and I put it down, and I look up, and, and there's Franz Duval standing there in front of me. It's a, it was so weird. Sometimes coincidences do happen, and they seem more than that anyway. So with that, um, I give you Franz Duval. Yep. Um, so, um, yeah, I was just saying that uh, we met back in the 90s. I've read all your books. Uh, I have to say that uh, I was talking to my wife last night about the new book, Mama's uh-huh. Last Hug. We're, we are new parents. We have a two-and-a-half-year-old, and she said, I don't even want to know what the story is because I know it's going to be sad <laughs> just on the title because <laughs> <laughs> she can imagine being a mom and giving her last hug. And Well, that is kind of a moving story to begin with, but it's it's so- something of an, an-, or a, um, an avenue into animal emotions. I thought I would dive into your book through a, a, um, a little story from my own Skinnerian training that I write about in uh, The Believing Brain. This was my uh, master's thesis um, advisor, Doug, Doug Naverick. So Doug got uh-huh. his doctorate under uh, Douglas Fantino, who got his doctorate under Hernstein and, and then Skinner. So that's the, the lineage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Hernstein. Yep. yep. So when we were graduate students, he, he reminded me of that kind of Skinnerian uh, you know, black box. It's just a black box. All we see are behavior. So, and this is what he he had told us students. And I, when I was writing the Believing Brain, I, I confirmed this is his philosophy, or at least it was. I reject mentalistic explanations of behavior. In other words, attributing behavior to theoretical constructs that refer to internal states like understands, feels that, knows gets it, figures out, wants, needs, believes, thinks, expects, be, pleasure, desire, etc. The reified concepts that students routinely use in their papers despite instructions that they could lose points for doing so. <laughs> and, and then I write, it isn't just students who reify mind out of behavior. Virtually everyone does because mind is a form of dualism that I shall argue in a later chapter appears to be innate to our cognition. We're natural-born dualists, uh, Paul Bloom says. Um, and yet, I have no no trouble at all intuiting the fact that you're feeling something based what mm-hmm. I see and so on. So, and as you know, philosophers call this the problem of other minds. How do I know what another mind is thinking or feeling? All I can see is, you know, what I see. And uh, and that's the problem. You're, you really, your whole career has been pushing back against this sort of old black box Skinnerian, uh-huh. we only see behaviors. How do you work around that problem of, of other minds? Well, I work um, with animals who cannot talk, which is um, which is a disadvantage and an advantage. It's a it's a disadvantage because I cannot ask them how they feel and what their experiences are. Um, but it is an advantage because I think humans lie a lot, so I don't trust humans. They, all the psychologists. I'm here in the psychology department. I'm a biologist. All the psychologists use nowadays questionnaires, and they trust what people tell them, and I just don't. Uh, and so I'd much rather work with animals where instead of asking how often they have sex, I just count how often they have sex, which to me is more reliable. And, and so um, I, I do distinguish when I talk about the emotions, because this book is about the emotions. I do distinguish emotions and feelings. Feelings, um, I cannot know in the animals. I, I can deduce them. I can guess at them. I personally feel it's a very similar situation with humans. Humans can tell me their feelings, but they're still, even if you tell me that you are sad, I don't know if that's the same sadness as that I would feel under the same circumstances. So I can only guess at what you feel. And maybe there are mixes in there of feelings that you're not even, you're not even aware of. And so you can also not communicate them to me. So I feel in humans, we have also that problem is that feelings are less accessible. And, and more guesswork. Uh, and so uh, I'm perfectly comfortable guessing at the feelings of animals sometimes, uh, even though you, you should distinguish the things that you can measure. I, I can measure the facial expressions. I can measure the blood pressure. I can measure their behavior. Uh, but what they feel, I cannot really measure. Yeah, so here I, I sometimes apply the Copernican principle that, you know, we're not special. To myself, I'm not special. So... It, the chances of me being the only sentient being in the universe and you're all a bunch of philosophical zombies walking around is is pretty unreasonable. So if 
if I feel my feeling inside is sadness and I'm and I'm crying at some sort of loss, and then I see you've had a loss and you're crying, it seems reasonable to infer that you feel sad inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, and so that same reasonable principle you could apply to other species. Now, the closer that species is to you, the easier it is, of course. So a chimpanzee or a bonobo, they cry and they have expressions and they, they have laugh expressions also. And they have all these the same sort of expressions as we do. And it's fairly easy to infer that the feelings behind it, the experiences behind it may be very similar too. Now, if you move to an elephant, and that's still a mammal, if you move to a fish, it becomes really difficult. Uh, because the fish doesn't have facial expressions, um, but th- that doesn't mean that the fish doesn't feel anything. That would be a very biased view if if we feel that you need to have facial expressions to feel something. But of course, the human literature is a bit like that. In the human literature, it is a bit like we have six basic emotions, and that is because we have six basic expressions. So, so, so the the tie between emotions and expressions has been made very explicit. Yeah, there it is. I was looking for that reference to Jeffrey Musiaf Masson's When Elephants Weep. I, yeah. read, I, I read that in 94 when that came out, and I read Temple Grandin's books, and you know that, 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 those were very moving. I thought, yeah, how could we not possibly at least reasonably think that they are feeling something similar to what we feel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet you, yeah, so I, I, I do normally focus on the, the behavior, the expressive behavior, uh, but behind it, of course, uh, must be similar feelings. That's at least what Darwin thought. And I, I, I was fortunate, I was a student of Jan van Hoof, a professor who was specialized in facial expressions of the primates. And so from the beginning as a student, I heard a, a lot of talk about emotions and facial expressions. And, and, and even though that was at the time still a taboo, no one, no one of my other professors liked to talk about animal emotions. Uh, they avoided it as, as the pest, um, even though uh, they would not deny them. I think the denial of animal emotions you don't feel anymore. It's very hard to find people who say that they don't have them. But um, there's still lots of hedging about it and quotation marks and all of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Darwin published um, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals in 1871, was it, I think? Something like that. And it's really almost a century before the taboo against it uh, started to lift, and it really wasn't until the 1990s that um, you began to yeah. talk about these things. When yeah, at, Darwin, Darwin's book on the emotions is the only book of Darwin that has disappeared from view for a century. Right. All the other books were celebrated, but that book, uh, and that's partly because of Hernstein and Skinner and people like that, that book was sort of taboo. It was, it was considered silly to, to think that animals would have the same sort of emotions as we do. Yes, and I and I think evolutionary psychologists and sociobiologists like Ed Wilson have gotten when they got pushback, it was the same kind of taboo, uh, implying that uh, evolution applies to the human brain and human emotions and and all those kinds of uh, intuitive states or feelings would have an evolutionary history. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the sociobiologists and and also my biology professors, most of them. They had a way out. They didn't need to talk about the emotions because they would talk about the function of behavior. They would not say the animal is afraid. No, the animal escapes from danger or something. And so they didn't need to talk about it because they phrased everything in functional terms. And that is still a trick that people often apply. So if you, if you, for example, were to say that two animals love each other and they're very attached to each other, they would say, why would you call it that way? They're, they're just bonded and they, they benefit from each other. And, and so they, they, they phrase it functionally. Uh, they prefer that. And, mm-hmm. and, and that is a sort of safe procedure. But I have decided in this book that um, I'm not going to follow that anymore because all my life I've talked basically about animal emotions without men- mentioning the emotions explicitly. Uh, and so now I'm, I'm writing explicitly on the topic and what we know about it. Yes, and you do talk uh, in most of your books about the social context or political context of of uh, science. Why do you think it, it it got pushed back a century? It, does it have something to do with the, the Holocaust and eugenics and and what all that bad political stuff? And and, and and in the 50s and 60s, scientists said we can't even think about going that route. Yeah, in the 60s, uh, the, the war World War II had an effect on the study of aggression. Aggression became a very popular topic in the, in the 60s and 70s. 
And then we got the phase of selfishness, you know, the selfish genes and all of this. We got the phase of competition and selfishness that sort of naturally grew out of that. So I think that the war had an effect on that. But the silencing of mental processes and emotions in animals, that started before World War II. You know, that started in the 1920s, 1930s. And I think it's because scientists like Skinner, they wanted to be hard-nosed. They want to be like the, like the physics, you know, uh, the f- they, they want to be get away from everything that was what they call speculation, even though, you know, there's a lot of invisible things that we assume in life. So, for example, evolutionary theory, evolution is not necessarily a visible process. And under some circumstances it is, but most of the time it isn't. Still, we believe very strongly that evolution happened. Uh, continental drift is unobservable, but we still very believe very strong, strongly that it happened. And the same thing with animal feelings and animal consciousness. You can assume it as a sort of theory and see how things fit. And things fit very well with that kind of theory. Yeah. But they, you know, the, the, the behaviorists, they were not really ready for that. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of that physics envy that's always gone on in the social sciences. Although, as I like to say, the social sciences are the hard sciences in as much as there's way more variables. You know, physicists uh-huh. complain about the three-body problem. Well, we have the three-million-body problem, <laughs> or in this case, the seven billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bo- yeah and problem. biology is very complex, of course. It, it's 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 there's so many influences on everything. It's so tightly interwoven that it makes it extremely complex. Yeah. Well, let me come at it a slightly different way with uh, through AI. I, I once had the chance to meet. Um, um, uh, David Ferrucci, who was the IBM scientist who uh, directed the team that built Watson, the uh, AI that won Jeopardy. Anyway, we were at Peter Thiel's house for a little party, and and I asked him kind of kind of tongue in cheek, "Does Watson know that he won Jeopardy? I mean, was he just thrilled that he beat Ken Jennings, the all time champion?" And he said, "Yeah, I I told him he did." It's like, no, no, I mean, did was he like thrilled, like I beat Ken Jennings, I am the world <laughs> champion? And, no, of course not. But <laughs> so, so how do you, how, how would you think about like programming into uh, an artificial intelligence those internal states of feeling happy? I mean, he could have programmed in for the Watson to yell out, "Yay, I won!" But we wouldn't infer from that that he's feeling the same thing we feel. Yeah, I think I think that the AI people are interested in affective programs because the way we biologists look at emotions is, of course, as prone to action. Emotions trigger actions that are adaptive. So, so fear is an adaptive emotion because it it may trigger certain behaviors like hiding and escaping and so on. And so we look at the emotions, and Darwin did already, as, as stimulating certain behavior. And I think the AI people are interested in that because the emotions organize behavior. The emotions are actually a very smart system, very interesting system compared to the instincts. So you may say, the instincts trigger also behavior, but the instincts are quite inflexible. Emotions, let's say you are afraid of something, that doesn't, the emotion of fear doesn't trigger your behavior. The emotion just prepares your body for behavior. Mm. And you still need to take a decision. Do I want to escape? Do I want to fight? Do I want to hide? What, are, what is the best behavior under the circumstances? And so your emotion triggers a, a situation, and then your cognition comes in to to find the solution. It's a very very nice system, and the AI people are interested in that organizational system of behavior. I, I'm not sure they ever they will ever construe the feelings behind the emotions. I don't I don't think that's an easy thing to do. But certainly, organizing behavior according to emotions is possible. You know, when I was a boy, I had um, tropical fish, and I, I always enjoyed having a Siamese fighting fish or a beta. And you hold that mirror up to the tank, and it flares out. The gills come out. The fins. And I always wondered: is he is he feeling threatened? I mean, what would that mean? The little. I mean, he doesn't have much of a brain. Uh, and it then does what, mean that he doesn't have self recognition, like that recent fish, you know, the the cleaner fish, who where they discovered self recognition. I don't think the betas have that. No. Yeah, no, just but then, keep fighting and fighting. But then when I got into to a psych program, then I read about uh, Tin Bergen and and the stickleback fish and. And uh, whoever did the research on the gulls with the red dots at the end of the yellow beaks, the uh-huh. super stimulators, and and so on, and they, and they had that whole sequence, almost like it was a computer program, like the sign stimulus, the little red dot, triggers an innate releasing mechanism in the brain, and, and they would have the little arrow go up there and circle around, and then out comes the behavior, the fixed action <laughs> pattern of pecking at the 
the dot, almost like it's it's a computer program algorithm just running along. Now, yeah, how yeah. do you scale up from that to say a, a chimp brain or a human brain to say, well, when a male sees a you know, a pornography film and naked female or whatever, it triggers almost like in the Siamese fighting fish or the or the gull that same kind of response. But we would think of it as way more complex or something like that. So, in other words, what I'm getting at. Scaling up from something super simple to much more complex, we, we have a kind of a bottom-up creation of emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, although I think sexual arousal is not the best example of very complex emotions there. <laughs> it's pretty basic, <laughs> I guess. Because I think it is sometimes quite simplistic. Uh, but yeah, uh, we humans, we have complex emotions and we mix a lot of emotions. And, and so we sort them out and we regulate them. We downregulate them sometimes. Uh, and, and that is something that really interests me is do, do animals, what kind of regulation do they have of their emotions? There are experiments on that, uh, that it's not really an, because people often think that, yes, we have emotions, but we can suppress them and animals have emotions that they have to follow them. That's not the case. We do the marshmallow test, for example, with apes nowadays, the marshmallow test being that you put a kid in a situation where he can eat a marshmallow, but he can also wait and get a second one. And kids are willing to wait for 15 minutes or so. If you do that with apes, they're also willing to wait for 15 minutes. So mm. they can control these emotions. They seek distractions from the situation because they know, they know they're dealing with certain emotions. So you have a certain awareness of it and you have a certain control over it. And this whole idea that emotion regulation is typically human and that the animals just follow them uh, is, is sort of out of the window. So I'm very interested in that. The, the reason I, you know, I wrote about Mama and her hug uh, and took that as the, the starting point of the book is because um, Jan van Hoof, the professor who hugged Mama, uh, he uh, came on TV, on Dutch TV, and they showed a the little clip that everyone has seen now where he, where he and Mama hug each other. And both him and myself, we were a bit shocked and how shocked the people were. Mm. So people cried and they saw it many times and they were very influenced by it. And we thought, well, this was perfectly normal chimpanzee behavior that she was showing. There was nothing surprising about the behavior. It was a very touching moment, obviously, but there was nothing surprising about the behavior. And so I wrote this book partly because I noticed that people did not know how human-like the expressions of the apes are, that that these expressions of embracing and hugging and calming someone down and having a big smile on your face, that all of that is common behavior in the primates and that is not unique to the human. And so I felt to basically reiterate what Darwin already had said is that there are many of the same expressions. Yeah, uh, when I wrote about your uh, experiment with the capuchin monkeys and the grapes versus the pebble or the, the grapes versus the cucumbers, mm -hmm. You know, and I said, you know, the, the capuchin monkey that got cheated out of the uh, out of the reward and got the cucumber instead of the grape, he was pissed. He was angry that there was an an injustice done, and, uh -huh. he, wa and he wanted it, you know, righted. He threw the 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 cucumber back. He pounded on the the, the table and the walls. He was clear. anyway. I got pushed back from that, saying you don't know what his internal state is. You don't know he was pissed off or angry. It's like, come on. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what I would have done. So, I mean, well, the funny thing is that the, the primates, of course, like these monkeys, they have all the same expressions and same behaviors as we do. And so the, these monkeys, they were shaking their cage and, and, and throwing something out. The behavior is so extremely similar and the circumstances are so similar. I, I always say that if related species behave in a similar way under similar circumstances, you have to assume a shared psychology behind it. It is just not acceptable in, in this day and age of Darwinian philosophy, so to speak, to, to assume something else. You have to go with the assumption of similarity. And if people want to make the point that it's maybe not similar, that maybe the monkey was very happy while he was throwing out the stuff, then they, they have a lot of work to do to convince me of that. Yeah. Well, the, um, uh, what's the, uh, the last common ancestor with chimps, bonobos, and us, six, six and a half million? You know, yeah, so the, the, million, yeah. uh, or, and go back to about 10 million for all the great apes and us. So the, these are pretty ancient emotions mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. much further back than that because in, in, in Mama's Last Hug, you talk about rats. Uh, uh -huh. And so there we're talking about tens of millions of years uh, <laughs> of a common yeah, yeah, yeah. ancestor. So these are ancient circuits. 
Well, the, the, there's even more ancient, like um, the bonding mechanism based on oxytocin, you know, the neuropeptides in bonding. That goes back to, to rodents, but probably also goes back to fish at some point. So um, I think the, these neuropeptide circuits that we use in attachments and bonding, they're very ancient. They're, they're, they're even older than the mammals, probably. Yeah. One analogy I like to use for trying to talk about emotions is something like uh, the evolutionary psychologists tell us the kinds of features that we're attracted to and members of the opposite sex say women like men with broad shoulders and symmetrical faces, smooth skin and a, and a you know, hip to waist ratio of such and such. And, and, and men find attractive in women that hourglass shape and 0.67 waist to hip ratio. But no one walks into a singles bar with calipers and measuring mm -hmm. uh, instruments. They just feel something like I'm attracted to that person right there. It, which is just a feeling, so that in a, in a way, emotions and feelings are natural selection's way of of running the algorithm without you having to think about anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. They call that the wisdom of the emotions. <laughs> the, the, the emotions evolved over a long period of time, and so my view on that is that um, usually in in psychology, people assume that there are six basic emotions and, and that's based on Ekman's work with the facial expressions. There are six expressions that we recognize all over the world and that everyone uses. And all the other emotions are called secondary or tertiary emotions because they're uniquely human. They're not necessarily visible in the face. And my view is that actually all the emotions that we have can be found in other species. And uh, I don't see why we need to limit it to six. For example, one of the emotions that is not in the list of six Basic emotions is love and attachment. Even though we know love and attachment, we can find in birds, we can find it in many species. And uh, uh, so I, I don't agree with the fact that there are just six basic emotions. I think all the emotions, and I treat in my book, some that people have proposed as uniquely human, for example, disgust, strangely enough, has been produced, uh, produced as uniquely human. I think all of them can be found in other species. So if a chimp or bonobo comes across a pile of, of feces or vomit, uh, what, what, what is their expression for that? Well, there's actually experiments now on this. There's, there's people who do experiments where they put interesting food on top of some feces and see if the chimp is willing to take it. They don't. They course, refuse it. I would they, hope they not. Take the, <laughs> they take the food next to it, but not the food on it. Right. So, so we do actually experiments on this. Disgust is, I think, a very old emotion. Um, and the facial expression of the chimps, they have the same facial expression with the wrinkly nose that we have for disgust. The chimps show that, for example, when it rains, they don't like rain. But they also show that sometimes under circumstances where they encounter a dead rat or something like that. So they, um, yeah, I think disgust is a very old emotion. And so some of these emotions are produ uh, proposed as, um, as um, uniquely human, but I think we can find them. Yeah, you have, I uh, was just looking at the illustrations you have in the book for um, the horse wrinkling up its nose and <laughs> and, and, uh, and and so what what is the uh, what, what's going on with the smile or the baring of the teeth but maybe it's not a snarl baring of the teeth maybe it's something else yeah the bearing of the teeth is very complex because in many primates the, it is a fearful signal so they bear their teeth when they're afraid or when they're submissive uh, so they're intimidated by the dominant um, so it became a signal, we think, of appeasement and, and non-hostility, basically showing the dominant, I'm not hostile, don't expect any trouble from me, I'm friendly at this point. And then over time, in the apes especially, and then in humans, it became more and more a friendly signal. So not necessarily a fear signal, although we still say if someone smiles too much, we say they are nervous. Oh yeah, there, uh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, that's, right. the, that's the disgust phase. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the disgust face that chimps show in the rain, right? which looks exactly like the disgust face of humans. Right. So disgust is an interesting case because in disgust, we know that the facial expression is the same across chimps and humans. We know that the insula in the brain is involved. If you stimulate the insula in the monkey who's chewing on good food, like a peanut, the monkey will spit it out because the insula um, triggers disgust. In humans, if you put humans in a brain scanner and you show them piles of feces or things that they don't want to see, 
the insula is activated. So here we have a, an emotion that is triggered under the same circumstances, that is shown in the face in the same way, that is shown in the brain in the same way. So we have to assume it's the same emotion across the board. So that's why I don't agree with certain scientists who yeah. have declared disgust a uniquely human behavior. No. So what are, what are the six emotions that Ekman outlines? Uh, he has anger, fear, Disgust is one of them. Yeah, uh, I was trying to find that. Literally. He doesn't even. He doesn't even have love in there. Uh, uh, joy, joy is in there. Yeah, it seems cl it seems clear. Love is a different emotion than joy or happiness or lust. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, people um, that you know, anthropologists that study this, like um, what's her name in New York City, the anthropologist studies love. Um, uh, she she makes a distinction between lust and love, and you know, the sort of short term, powerful feelings of sexual attraction versus long term bonded attachment. That seems, that makes a lot of sense to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 the, and the the love in the in the sense of attachment you can find in in animals. And so, for example, uh, in the field we know that primates sometimes have lifelong friendships, not even based on sexual relations, and maybe between two males or between two females, they may have a lifelong friendship. Uh, and so that is certainly a, a bonding mechanism right there. Helen Fisher, why? Uh -huh. Oh why, yeah, I know. Why we love? Yeah. yeah, I mean, she shows that some of these uh, uh, these hor when these hormones kick in, it, I mean, it's like a, a drug. It's like a cocaine uh -huh. hit for some people when they, you know, that's the person, that's the one, and they uh -huh. are just so focused and you know, just almost uncontrollably <laughs> powerful emotion that is not joy or happiness or you know, it's none of those. It's its own thing. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, when I first saw Ekman give his talk uh, about the universality of it, it seemed pretty obvious. You know, wherever you film these things, and, and, and again, back to my graduate training, we, I took a course in e ethology, as it was called at the time, where we had our textbook was Eibel Eibesfeld's um, okay, great book sure. yeah. with, with, with those great camera shots from long distance where he's pointing the camera one way, but he's actually filming this way so that people wouldn't. Yeah, you know that this has become an ethics issue is that some people don't want to use his films because they were filmed without consent. Oh, um, come with, on. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. There's, there's a controversy surrounding that material. He, yeah. didn't, he didn't have But I know I Ibisfeld, for example, he demonstrated, he studied um, children that were born deaf and blind. And he demonstrated that they have all the same expressions. Uh, so, so they laugh when you tickle them and things like that, or they cry. And, and so he used that as an argument to say that these expressions are biological because they have no way of learning them from others since they're deaf and blind. So, so, yeah, in the time of Ekman, this, this was a big discussion point because the anthropologists had claimed that human facial behavior was too variable to be biological. It, it was different all over the world, they said. And so Ekman set out to, to prove them wrong, basically, saying, no, no, it's not different all over the world. All over the world, we understand expressions in, in a very similar way. And if you ever go to a place where you don't speak the language, like let's say you go to China or Japan where I don't speak the languages, you can still have a, a sort of communication on a nonverbal basis of being friendly or not friendly or happy or not happy, and people will understand you. Yeah, I like the way you describe this. Uh, what if people uh, everywhere were affected by popular Hollywood movies and television shows? Could this account for the uniformity of reactions? So Ekman traveled to one of the f uh, farthest corners of the planet to administer his test to preliterate tribe in Papua New Guinea. Not only had these people never heard of John Wayne or Marilyn Monroe, they were unfamiliar with television and magazines. Yet they still correctly identified most of the emotional faces that Ekman held in front of them, and they themselves showed no novel, unusual expressions in 100,000 feet of motion pictures of their daily lives. So Ekman is really confirming what Ibisfeld found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Ekman, is, uh, in his approach, was clearly Darwinian. And now there are, of course, sometimes question marks behind his work, and people would say, well, um, it, it is not as clear-cut as we thought. But still, by and large, he's the one who put facial expressions as biological phenomena on the map. Maybe the analogy to make is that uh, with, with language, everyone's born with the capacity to speak a language, and the culture tweaks, you know, which language you learn and or what the gra grammatical sequences of verbs and nouns and adjectives and so on. But, you know, there's a core foundation underneath it. Maybe emotions are like that. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it is definitely true that emotions ha- emotions do have cultural rules and how you express them. For example, in some cultures, smiling is much more common. For example, Americans, they always like to smile when they stand on photos, but there's other people who don't smile when, they, when you take a picture of them. And so the rules are sometimes different, but the expressions are essentially the same and the interpretation is essentially the same. So the quick guide to whether someone's giving you a fake smile or a real smile is whether the corners of the eyes are pulled down. And if they're not, then it's fake. I, I, yeah, so this is called the Duchenne smile. Duchenne was um, was before Darwin. He was a French neuroscientist, or, or I don't know what he was, a neurologist in France. And he, he had a, a, a few people who had facial paralysis. So they had the muscles and they had the face, but they could not feel anything in their face. And so he could put electrodes on their face. At that time, must have been quite primitive to do that, put electrodes on their face and stimulated them. And then he contracted muscles and he saw so he could produce a smile on, on his subject. But he was never happy with the smile. He he said it doesn't look like a real smile. It was just the mouth. And then one day he told this subject a joke, a very good joke in French, I suppose. <laughs> and uh all of a sudden, he got a real smile, a real full-blown smile. And that's where Duchenne decided that the smile needs contraction of the eyes and narrow, narrowing of the eyes to be a real smile. And so we now distinguish the fake smile and the Duchenne smile. Right. So it's a whole complex suite of muscles. You also talk in the book about the number of muscles in the face of humans and that uh, early scientists said, well, we're unique because of that until someone actually – did an autopsy on a chimp face and encountered yeah. and they're the I've same. Heard, I've heard that all my life is that I heard that, uh, yes, maybe primates have facial expressions, but they must be really simple because we have far more muscles in the face than uh, a chimpanzee or whatever. Until people analyzed the faces of chimpanzees and found exactly the same number of muscles in there. So uh, that whole story doesn't hold up. But that's because we when we look at a human face, we interpret many little details of it. And I think chimps do that with each other also. But when we look at a chimp, we only see the bold expressions, the, the, the very flamboyant expressions when we look at them. Yeah, that, all of that early research probably would have been rejected by our IRB boards today. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you get informed consent uh, for, say, Ibisfeld subjects, because the moment you tell them, we're filming you to see what your expressions are, that's going to change their expressions. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're now putting all these films in an archive in Germany. Uh, and But there's still some con- controversy, but st- I still feel it was not – was not necessarily unethical what he did. Um, I, I, we wouldn't do it anymore now, but um, now that we have the films, I think we should probably use them. Well, same thing with Milgram's experiments. No one's going to approve a electric shock uh, experiment, mm-hmm. even if it's faux, yeah, uh, yeah. simply because people could be affected. And yet, the, the, the research is certainly useful still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing with Zimbardo's uh, fake prison experiment at Stanford. Um, Anyway, so, yeah, we, we don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I was distressed to read your, your thing about uh, TV sitcoms and Hollywood movies featuring monkeys and apes. Uh, every time I see them dressed up, see me an, see me an actor produce one of their silly grins, uh, you cringe. People think they're hilarious, but I know their mood is the opposite of happy. It's hard to get these animals to bare their teeth without scaring them. Only punishment and domination call forth these expressions. That's not allowed to, uh, anymore in Hollywood movies or TVs, is it? I mean, no, the, the whole no animals were harmed in this movie. Um, we, we've come a ways on that, hopefully. Well, the reason I, I love the Planet of the Ape movies is that they can do these things now with animations. Right. Uh, I, I have some problems with the movie, those movies because they're so violent and, and females and children don't really feature in the movies. But still, um, I'm so happy that Hollywood has found a way of having apes in movies without having real apes in movies. Because we primatologists, we absolutely hate it if they do that. And they, they may still do it on occasion, but I think it is becoming rare because of the public pressure now to, to clean up their behavior. Yeah. But there was a time where Hollywood had trainers who called themselves even affective training or something. Affective. Not effective, but affective. Yeah. So, yeah. But, so to, to show how nice they were with the animals... And they used cattle prods and stuff like that. So, so um, they they had this whole spiel that they were friendly, but they were not. That's terrible. Um, let's see, Lisa Barrett. Yeah, Lisa Feldman Barrett. Let's talk about her. I read her book. Uh huh. Uh, I don't. I was looking for. I can't remember the name of her book now. 
Um, but she's she's pretty critical of Ekman, if I recall. And she had some good examples of emotions that we would call anger or joy or something like that, that in a different context, it looks the same, but it's really different because the context is different. Yeah. Now, by the time... Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem if you take, for example, joy and you show a laughing face. Clearly, laughing means joy, I suppose. We also laugh under circumstances that are not necessarily joyful. We may laugh at somebody. It may, it may be even racist to laugh at somebody. Or we we laugh at somebody who falls, which is but we call it Schadenfreude, is a German word. Yeah. So so we have many conditions under which we laugh. We may also have a nervous laugh that has nothing to do with having fun. Um, and so yes, we, we every expression that you take has multiple uses and mul multiple feelings associated with it. And so to reduce laughing to joy, as is done in the Ekman studies, is is a bit simplistic. There's much more going on. Usually when I when I think about Feldman Barrett, um, I, I think that there's a, a distinction between feelings and emotions, and she's mostly talking about feelings. Mm. She's mostly talking about how humans interpret their own emotional life and express it in language, which is what the feeling part is. And that is where you see an enormous variability. Uh, and you see that also internationally. So, for example, the feelings of uh, a Frenchman uh, or a Dutchman are often very different. Um, because um, we express these things in, in language very differently. Th that doesn't mean that the facial expressions are very different, but the, but the way we talk about feelings is extremely culturally variable, I think. And, and I think when Feldman Barrett talks about the variability in human emotions, she is right mostly for the feeling part, not so much for the emotion and the expression part, I think. So again, to distinguish those, the feelings are the internal states, the emotions are the behavioral expression of those internal states. Yeah, the, emo the, the feelings are private states that you communicate through language and, and that depend on your interpretation of your own emotional life, so to speak, and how you phrase it and how you put it in words. And the emotions are sort of on the interface between mind and body. The emotions are always in the body. Uh, the heart rate, the voice, uh, the color, uh, facial expression, everything changes. Emotions affect, affect you. And, and that's actually where the word emotion comes from. It moves you. And so um, emotions are bodily states. And they are quite constant across the board. Uh, and, and that's also Ekman's work. They're quite constant uh, in terms of their facial expressions. So yes, on, in the, on the emotion side, you have subcortical. I don't know if you know the work of Jak Panksepp, for example. Yep, yep. Uh, he would he would call about the subcortical emotions. So emotions go back very very far in time and are expressed in the body in very similar ways. Now, how we interpret these bodily states and what we do with them in our daily life—that's the feeling part, and that's where the variability sits. I think it was Panksepp that stimulated the. I think it was the insula of the. Of the cat, where the cat just just leaps out at him and like to, wants mm -hmm. to rip his face off, yeah. uh, and, and you know clearly the, 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 this is a rage circuit. I think he called it a rage circuit, and then he got yeah. pushed back saying, "Well, you don't know it's rage." It's like, well, yeah. what else would you call this animal that's trying to rip my face off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Panksepp has done a lot for establishing how old the emotions are and how. Uh, how we find them in all the mammals. Uh, he worked with mammals, but as, I, I bet if you go further back, you find it in other species as well. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you introduced the, this whole the stuff we talked about before, like when elephants weep and you know the kind of uh, positive emotional life of animals, but in this part of the book, you, 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 you get into the darker side, the inner demons versus the better angels. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I was recently talking to David Sloan Wilson. He's got a new book coming out. Uh, about group selection, he you know he pushes group selection as does uh, Ed, Ed Wilson and, and a few others, um, but 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 it's mostly couched in this um, model of explaining altruism and cooperation and the nice side of human nature. To which I responded, well, but this whole you know sort of extreme empathy you have for your fellow group members actually works against other group members. You're even going to be even more violent to other potentially threatening members of another group. So this is like Paul Bloom's book, Against Empathy. You know, be careful holding up empathy as this wonderful emotion. It actually has a dark side. Yeah. Well, it, it is true that m most of the books on emotions in animals, they dwell on the positive. 
they, how they love each other, how they hug each other, how they um, help each other, um, grieving, that kind of things. And, and I think that's all very impressive. But of course, the emotional life of animals is just like a dead of humans. There's a lot of nasty emotions and, and, and competitive emotions going on as well. And so the, um, I, since I have seen so much of the chimpanzee politics and so on, I know those emotions also, and I know that they can kill each other. And, and so even though I'm very interested in empathy, um, I, I, when I describe, for example, empathy in chimpanzees and bonobos, people say, well, you know, that these guys, they sometimes kill each other, as if, they, if that's discounting their mm. empathy. But the same is, of course, true for humans. We don't say that humans lack empathy because we on occasion on the very different occasions we kill each other so we have this whole two extremes of emotions we can be awfully nice to each other and we can be awfully awful to each other uh, and, and and i think in all the animals you find these two extremes also yeah D dawkins calls that reading reading books by their title like is the selfish gene or i'm here i'm thinking of uh, napoleon shagnon's book about the yanomamo which he subtitled the fierce people and then he had to walk that back and, and say well th th you know when they eat they're not fierce when they make love they're not fierce you know they're you know when they play with their children they're not fierce as, as if you have to be one or the other uh -huh, uh -huh. so yeah so let's talk about violence aggression you know the different kinds of violence and aggression there are why there's a there's a certain logic to um, needing to be uh, at least a, a badass, a reputation of being a badass, so you're not picked on by other group members, and that requires uh -huh. occasionally you actually you engage in violence to show that your reputation uh, is sound. You're not just pretending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, in in chimpanzees, we we know of killings within the group. And, and I've described in my book, I described one of the killings that I've witnessed in captivity. When that happened, I thought maybe it's a product of captivity. People said, people said to me, like, yeah, are they killing each other? What do you expect if you lock them up? But now we know that wild chimpanzees do the same thing, exactly the same thing. They, they, they brutally kill uh, leading males sometimes if they lose their position and if they are not happy with those males. So these things happen. Uh, at the same time, of course, chimpanzees can also be good friends and, and male chimpanzees are not just competitors. They also help each other and they defend the territory together. So that whole tension between hating each other on occasion and being friends together on other occasions, that whole tension between the two you see also played out in, in chimpanzees. And humans. <laughs> and humans, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this is part of the problem of the literature on war. You know, are we naturally warlike species? And people always call attention to, you know, chimpanzee uh, violence. And, you know, what, what is it if you have a, a majority, you attack, and if it's a minority, you, you flee? Uh, you know, and I they, don't know why they always dwell on the chimpanzee. We have another close relative, the bonobo, which is exactly equally close to us as the chimp. And the bonobo is marginalized by the anthropologists generally because the bonobo is too sexy and too friendly and too <laughs> female dominated for them. <laughs> so they don't know what to do with it because they have this whole scenario in their head is that we humans, we, we came as far as we came because we killed everybody off. Even the Neanderthal story, right. we usually phrase in terms of how did we win, you know, how, how did we defeat them? Um, and so they have this whole scenario and the bonobo doesn't fit. And I always say, even though I'm not necessarily saying that our common ancestor was like a bonobo, I'm not sure of that, we need to pay equal attention to the bonobo. Right. The bonobo yeah. groups, for example, they can meet and they can mingle and they, it looks more like a picnic than like warfare. And, and we need to respect that. And, and, and when we build models of human evolution, we need to think about that. But um, the, the anthropologists have decided that the bonobo doesn't fit. Uh, it's almost like they're more of a domesticated species, and maybe we are half domesticated or something. I don't know. I'm always troubled by these debates. You know, are we naturally warlike? And, you know, when Pinker's book came out, The Better Angels of Our Nature, he got a lot of pushback, uh, you know, because he took the side of the of sort of the anthropologist saying it's, it's, in, our, it's, it's in our nature. It's there. Yeah. But yeah and he, he looks at civilization as the rescue which is a very Freudian idea, actually. Freud, Freud believed that civilization mm. suppressed our basic instincts. So he takes that Freudian path of, like, n naturally we are bad and nasty, but with a lot of civilization we can be nice and civil to each other. Uh, I don't believe a word of that. I think we have all these pro-social tendencies and cooperative tendencies in us 
we, we don't do, need to invent them culturally or something. They're just in us like a, they are in all the primates. And yes, culture can have an effect on which ones you pull out. Do you pull out more the aggressive tendencies or pull out more the, the, the nice tendencies? Culture can have an influence on that, but culture always plays with what we have naturally available. That's how I look at it. So that whole view of that we, we are born nasty, uh, and it's a very Calvinist view in a way. We're born nasty and we can work hard to be good. Well, uh, yeah. well the st steel man, Pinker's argument, it's that they're both in there, the inner demons and better angels. And the whole point of civil, civil society is to tweak the variables, to accentuate the one and attenuate the other. And that's mm -hmm. what we've been doing for 10,000 years is trying to get people to – it incentivize people to act one way instead of another way by either ha uh -huh. you know having police on every corner or military or laws and rules that are enforced or not look what happens to failed states they quickly dissolve into uh you know gangs and violence and homicide rates go way up um and what what is the evidence that um civilization is doing that is is um for example hunter gatherers they are not peaceful or um what is the evidence? And for example, if you compare, if you compare the, the the explorers, they were from Spain, from the UK. Uh, they explored in the New World and in Australia and so on. They were the aggressive ones. It was not like um, hmm. the native people were attacking them, trying to kill them. No, it was the opposite. It was the civilized people who were <laughs> the aggressors. And so, and so I, I don't see the evidence that okay, civilization that, that, has made us nicer, uh, but, necessarily. But, but, yeah, but, but, but um, that's a slightly different example because here you're having conflicts between two different kinds of civilizations as opposed uh, to within one group. Uh, I, mm -hmm. think, I think Pinker's argument is that uh, the decline of violence over, say, the last 700 years since, you know, reasonable records, say, in England of the 12th and 13th century where the rates of homicide were like 100 per 100,000 and now they're less than one per 100,000. So okay. that, that sort of decline, what's the explanation for that? Yeah. Well, I don't know. That, that's recent history. For me, that's extremely recent. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> so You're looking at the much bigger much picture. That. But I think, yeah, yeah. I, I think the larger point is, you know, it's, it's kind of a false question to ask, you know, are we warlike by nature? Are we good or evil? It's, it's too black and white, too simple. You know, okay. it's, human behavior is so much more complex than that. Um, again, it's like there's this constant tension between the inner demons and the better angels, and we're always trying to tweak systems. You know, liberal democracies are better than autocracies. Or theocracies, although you could argue that a you know a powerful dictator holds down um, you know the you know, a, a other potential um, gangs that would rise up, yeah. so he keeps he keeps a lid on violence that way. But we wouldn't yeah. praise that kind of control of violence. Okay. <laughs> kind of the obvious example. I, I I remember I watched this debate, debate number two between Hillary and, and Trump, yeah, yeah. And, and then SNL parried it exactly like you wrote about it. Like you know, Trump is like an an alpha male uh, chimp just hovering around back there, like he he wants to pounce and pound her into the ground, but he can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, is there... yeah. So that, the, for me, that was very interesting because I always followed um, the political situations and I always look at the body language of the leaders. And so when Trump tried to imitate his fellow Republicans, he was very at ease and he would yell at them and he would insult them and what was it, the low energy jab and uh, <laughs> right. the, the lying, L whatever, little, uh, little Marco. lying Ted. And he, he had nicknames for all of them and he was very impressive and imposing. And he, he played the role of intimidation extremely well. But I was very curious what he would do with Hillary because with a woman, these things don't work the same way. And that's also true for all the primates. The rules of fighting are very different between males and between males and females. Because since dominance, we usually look at high status as it gives you the advantage to have more females or more access to females. It is, it is, would be ridiculous for males to kill females, for example. So they, they have to inhibit um, their physical superiority. And uh, Trump was really um, torn, I think, in that he 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 looked like he he would want to pounce on on Hillary Clinton, but he couldn't, and so as a result, he he had right before that debate, he had uh, 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 invited some women to talk about Bill Clinton. He was much more comfortable attacking Bill Clinton. He had also some attacks on Obama at the time, 
So he was very comfortable with those things, but not with um, Hillary. And so uh, he, he lost that debate, according to many people. Uh, but after that debate, everyone was talking about how he was an alpha male. And, and this is really this stuck with me because the, the word alpha male comes partly from my book, Chimpanzee Politics, which made it popular. And people started now, then throwing it around. And now with Trump, they were all talking about him being an alpha male. And in that regard, uh, I don't agree at all, because uh, for me, an alpha male is very different from just a bully. Uh, and the best alpha males that I have known in chimpanzees are, are males who keep the group together and bring peace and uh, bring consolation for individuals who have lost the fight. Uh, and, and none of that is in Trump. Trump is very good at the intimidation part. And the, so the climb to alpha male was maybe fairly normal for him. But the leadership part where you keep the group together and and, and reconcile different parties within the group, uh, that part, the unification part, he's not really so strong. So there's an ethical component to being an alpha male that you care about the people below you or, or however you want to describe that. The, yeah, well, that makes you a popular alpha male. We also have bullies sometimes in chimpanzees. They often end very badly. They, they are either chased out of the group or they're killed by the group. Uh, but males who are very popular as alpha male, they, they just drop a few ranks when they lose their position. They become number five male or number four male, and they have a perfectly good, good life after that. If you're going to make a recommendation to a Democrat running against Trump in 2020, how should they act if they were in a debate? Uh, and what, what kind of confidence should they exude that shows that they have the, the capability of being a great leader without being a bully like Trump? Or getting you know, I would, I would have loved to seen Arnold Schwarzenegger go against Trump. Right. That would have been so great because because he's he's also a physical presence. And so then we would have really uh, the, the alpha chimp male contest right there. Yeah, you, you said in your book you would have liked to hear him say, call, call Trump a girly man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, that he, would have been great. and he could pull it off. <laughs> he could pull, he's, he's one of the few who could pull that off. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know you got uh, people waiting there for you, but um, the last chap couple chapters talking about uh, emotional intelligence and sentience, especially um, with uh, the animal rights um, uh, issues when I wrote The Moral Arc. Um, you know, people asked, well, what's the, you know, what's the next stage of moral development in human civilization? I thought, well, animal rights, really. Uh, uh -huh. I think just recognizing that they're sentient beings. Now, you make a distinction between sentience and consciousness. Yeah, the, I have several layers there uh, of, of distinction. But, but my main point is that um, we do not treat animals very well, certainly not in the agricultural industry. And so we need to, to do something about that. We cannot go on like, like we're doing. The, in the ideal world, we would grow artificial meat. Mm -hmm. we, that would be my ideal is then we don't need the animals at all for, for the meat industry and we would just grow it in some petri dishes but we haven't reached that point yet but I think we're going to reach that point at some point but, I, but, but let's clarify again between sentience and consciousness uh, as, as Bentham said it isn't can they think or talk or mm -hmm. reason and talk it's can they feel can they suffer yeah. And, and by sentience, you mean the capacity to suffer that we should be, whether, however smart they are or not, whether that yeah. they can use tools or not is irrelevant. They can feel. Yeah, sentience, sentience is de defined as that you can feel something. You, you, have, you have inner experiences, so to speak. And I think, at least for the positive and the negative, which is the simplest, like suffering and pleasure, for that, we have a lot of evidence, not just in the mammals, we, that goes well beyond the mammals, that every animal with a brain, basically, we assume, has those experiences. Yeah. So that applies to fish, that applies to insects, even. Right. Right. By the way, are you a uh, vegetarian or vegan or, or no. re reducitarian? No, or? I, no I'm, well, I, I, I do eat less meat and I, I, I try to avoid eating mammals. But for me, the issue is not so much the eating part, it's the treatment part. Treatment, yeah. As, yeah. as, 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 a, as a biologist, the cycle of life for me is a, is a natural thing, but the treatment part for me, that bothers me, yeah. 
So so-called happy farms where the animals run around and, and live out their physiological existence as they normally would, and then in, in, they have a great that life. That would, would be great if we have ways of verifying that, because I, I don't trust everything that you hear about meat, you know? Yeah. But uh, if, if we had a way where you buy meat and you can scan with your cell phone and you can see pictures of the actual animals in their actual environment, that would be a great advance, because I think... A lot of people, maybe not all the people, but at least I would say 40% of the people would be sensitive to information about how these animals were raised, you know? I had one of those Impossible Meat Burgers. It, um, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that the company, Impossible Meat? No, that's I that. don't know that. Yeah. Well, they, they make a – it's a plant-based meat patty that even bleeds a little bit, and, and it really does taste like meat. And then there was a story in the L.A. Times yesterday about the meat industry suing – them for calling it meat because they, oh. they want to call it meat because they want to be in the meat counter at <laughs> supermarkets. They don't want to be yeah. over in the, you know, the, the whole, whole foods, vegan, organic, because, you know, they know that's going to limit the, the, the market. And yeah, uh, we went through the same, we went through the same thing with milk, I believe. Milk, milk was also one of these yeah, names. The, that, yeah. The almond producers wanted to call it almond milk. And the and the <laughs> the dairy farmers are like, no, that's not milk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. Treatment. Um, that's what I liked about Temple Grandin's uh, work is that it's it's pretty unrealistic to say tomorrow we should end all meat consumption so we can end factory farming and so forth. That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just making their lives, um, you know, more tolerable or just less painful or re- reducing suffering seems to be yeah, the moral yeah. sure, sure. moral yeah. starting point. Um, right. So Mama's Last Hug, Animal and Human Emotions, uh, comes out. Well, we'll post this uh, the week it comes out. Um, your next great step on, you know, kind of breaking down that really it goes back to Descartes, you know, that there's this dualism, mm-hmm. this Cartesian break. And the animals is kind of the last of that, I think, you know, that they don't yeah. feel. Yes, they do feel. Yeah, yeah. So, so since I, my previous book was about the intelligence, I felt. It's now time to write about the emotions. We, 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 we tend to split those two, even though they're completely integrated, of course, in the lives of animals, in the lives of humans as well. Yeah. What's, what's next? What are you working on now? Oh, I'm not working on any book at the moment. I'm just focusing on this book and getting it out. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to retire. So uh, I, I've stopped my research already. And uh, I'm going to travel and write and stuff like that. You are? Where are you going to go? Are you going back to Europe? No, no. I'm, I'm traveling in the sense of giving lectures. I'm, oh, I'm giving I see. a lot of lectures across the board, yeah. Are you going to move into more activism uh, for animal rights or for – No, no, no. no, okay. no, no. I've yeah. never done that. No, no. I know. It takes a, a different kind of personality to do that. I, I always feel like I should do more of that, but I just don't feel like that's what I do. I, I mm-hmm. it, t- it takes a certain kind of – I don't know, risk aversion, openness, uh, you know, uh, disagreeableness, getting out there in, in people's faces to, you know, I don't know. It takes a certain kind of per- person to be an activist. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a role for the, you know, behind the scenes, uh, the science behind it, why we should care about yeah. animals and, yeah. and all that stuff. Really, there's few people uh, besides yourself that have done so much important work in this area. Uh, and uh, so congratulations on the new book. It's great, Franz. Really, Thank really, you. really a good read. And, and thanks for coming on. Okay, thank you. And thanks for having me. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.